Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When we hear the Beatitudes for the first time, it's tempting to philosophize about poverty, humility, sadness, etc., as though the Beatitudes themselves are a bunch of Greek platitudes. But if you've been with our podcast from the early days, you know a couple of things. One, that scripture refers to itself, interprets itself, and does not look outside of itself for meaning. And two, that scripture is written in opposition to Greek philosophy. To treat Jesus like a philosopher who spouts philosophical platitudes is anti-scriptural. So what is Jesus talking about in the Beatitudes? What is he teaching? The very same thing everything in the Bible teaches and refers to, the law of Moses. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 243 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We have finally come to the Sermon on the Mount, which is a beautiful transition in Matthew, because now Matthew begins to unleash wisdom in a full-throated manner. It begins with the Beatitudes, but it's relentless in Matthew. That's why it's a favorite gospel of so many who aren't familiar with the New Testament in general, because Matthew is just plain wisdom. And that's exactly what's happening in chapter 5. We've seen systematically the way in which Jesus shuns Jerusalem. This isn't about Jerusalem. It's not about the cult in Jerusalem. It's not about the scribes or the priestly orders in the temple. They are not necessary or germane to the one thing that is needful, which is the Torah. And in Matthew, it's the Torah to the Gentiles, as in Galatians. We always call this the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know where sermon comes from. We don't actually have sermon in this passage. But what we do have is teaching. We have disciples teaching and we have the opening of Jesus's mouth. Last time we talked about how he gathered up disciples so he could go and begin to teach. This is the opening lecture of Jesus. This is where he begins the teaching. And it's not enough to say it's the beginning of teaching in Matthew, but it's the beginning of teaching in the New Testament. This is the basis of the rest of the New Testament. Again, you know, Father, we've talked several times about how it's important that Matthew is the first book because it unfolds in a particular way. And so the fact that Jesus' first teaching, his first lecture, I would say lecture more than I would say sermon, but maybe that's because of my academic background. But this is where he lays out the foundation of not only everything he's going to say, but everything he's going to do and everything that's going to unfold in the rest of the New Testament. Well, in truth, it's neither a sermon nor a lecture. Jesus is now going to ascend the metaphoric mountain once again, which is the mountain of of the heavenly Zion. And he is going to, from a position of authority, give the law. It's not something different than what was already handed down. He's just going to, once again, give the law for the Gentiles. I think the crowds aren't exclusive. Matthew is a text that brings both communities together, but it's a text that moves beyond the temple, that moves beyond Jerusalem. It moves beyond the sectarian dispute. Matthew is, in a sense, bringing it all together and at the same time shaking the dust off of his feet. And so now Jesus is going to fulfill the Torah and the Old Testament 
by representing it to the whole world, not just the Jewish people. And this is a location that's not named, it's just the top of a mountain. Like you said, Father, it's not Jerusalem, and that's significant, because we've seen time and again that Jesus and everyone so far has been avoiding Jerusalem. This is very important, because the teaching comes from somewhere else else besides the human seat of authority. And one has to keep in mind that the Beatitudes themselves are a regurgitation of the Torah, but in a way that's very clever. It's a regurgitation of Paul's regurgitation of the Torah. It's not something new. It didn't change. The author didn't add his twist to it. The author is just presenting it here in a specific context, which is this broad messianic community. It's an eschatological community that Jesus is creating through the preaching of the Torah. So we'll see how especially language in Galatians has everything to do with the themes that we come across in the Beatitudes. But remember that it's drawing upon these texts in Galatians that are a regurgitation of the content of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Beatitudes really are about turning upside down what we think is good, what we think is beautiful, what we think is wonderful. It's really trying to reverse those things. So when we hear Beatitudes, we have to understand that some of the images are actually ugly in human sight, in the human mind, but in the way that Torah functions, they're positive. So it already is Jesus working to reverse the ideas and the concepts that we have because we philosophize based on our own assumptions, and Jesus has to reform those assumptions from the very first word that comes out of his mouth. We've said many times, and we were reminded just this last Tuesday, that the adversary in Scripture, your adversary, may very well be God himself. That's what we learned from the book of Job. It's not Satan in the end who's the adversary. Job is the adversary of God, and God manifests himself as the adversary of Job. So when we talk about the Beatitudes, we're talking about blessings. But as, again, we've said many times, what is a blessing in Scripture? For us, a blessing is the will of God, whatever his will decides. And that will is handed down to us in the content, literally, as Paul says in Galatians, of his will, the written scroll of the Bible. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Number one, he saw the crowds, the crowds being inclusive of all the nations, not just Israel. He went up on the mountain. It's the metaphoric mountain of the heavenly Jerusalem, of Zion. But we're nowhere near Jerusalem. And of course, upon that mountain, he is seated. He is seated because he is enthroned. This is, if you will, a literary foreshadowing of the raising of Christ in power, seated at the right hand of God, as the one seated in power, as the shepherd enthroned on God's mountain in the heavenly Jerusalem, his disciples come to him, to be judged, to be held accountable. And remember that the one who judges and the one who teaches, it's the same thing. That's why when you teach, if you're scriptural, you can't just make stuff up. You have to teach the content of scripture the way Jesus does, because the one who teaches is godly. If you open your mouth to speak and you speak your word, you're making yourself the adversary of God. That's what the Antichrist is. It's someone who speaks a word other than the scriptural word as an imposter, literally, on this throne that Jesus has taken. It's the teacher who sits and the students who stand. So when Jesus sits, it means that he is ready to teach. It doesn't say that the students sat. The teacher sat and the students stood so that they could learn and memorize what the teacher was saying. We have him sitting as teacher but also, as you said, Father, sitting as judge. And there's a relationship between the teacher and the judge because they both speak a word of authority. And to the extent that he stands out as the one seated, he is the existing one, as we discussed a couple episodes back. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
funny. Why did they say he opened his mouth and then taught? I mean, come on. We know how people talk. It's because it's only what comes out of Jesus that matters. And so there's this focus on Jesus as the one who's speaking. And so this has to be emphasized. Jesus is the one who opened his mouth. This is what the disciples have to learn. You know, our professor used to always tease us because we would say, Father Paul taught us. He would say, no, you learned whatever you learned. I taught whatever I taught. We'll see if it's the same thing when it's time for the exam. Father Paul would open up his mouth to speak, and it was up to us to hear the correct thing. But just because we heard something doesn't mean it was what came out of his mouth. And so making sure that the student is actually hearing what the teacher is saying, that's not something you can take for granted. And when we say that the teacher is also the judge and that these two functions are essentially interchangeable in Scripture, that will sound abrasive to someone who appreciates the Western egalitarian approach to pedagogy in which the students call the teacher by their first name and the teacher goes on and on about how much they can learn from the students and everybody's best friends and then the teacher really asks questions and doesn't make statements. Everybody loves that because it feels good. But as we've said, the teacher who holds all the power and pretends as though they don't ends up duping the students and controlling the students. Here, the Lord sits on his throne and he speaks the judgment and you can take it or leave it. And he lays it out in a very straightforward manner. That's the beauty of authority. You know where you stand. There's no duplicity and you can take it or leave it. This is the first beatitude in the first set of three beatitudes. There's a total of three sets of three. And right off the bat, Matthew is alluding to Paul's teaching in Galatians because Paul in chapter five deals with this question of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit versus the works of the flesh and this tension between the spirit and the law and the inheritance of the kingdom. So right after Paul goes through his discussion of all the different deeds of the flesh or the works of the flesh, he says, I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So for everyone who reads Galatians and says, well, Paul must be saying we don't have to follow the law anymore because he's talking about the spirit, you're not understanding what's going on. You're mixing terminology because there's the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There's the law in that sense, which is immutable. And there's the law, which is a character in the story given as part of that narrative with specific instructions about what to eat, and how to pray, and how to check for leprosy or whatever. So the law, which is the Pentateuch, still applies. And the law is given against all of these wicked behaviors that Paul has listed. So to be under the control of the Spirit is to be under the control of the teaching of the Pentateuch. It doesn't mean now that a specific regulation given to a specific character in the story still needs to be followed in order for you to follow what the Pentateuch is teaching. You're not off the hook. You still can't practice idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, or outbursts of anger, as Paul says. There's no patience for disputes or dissensions or factions. This is the same teaching in 1 Corinthians, but it's all coming from the law that people like to say was dismissed in the New Testament. It's not dismissed. It's represented. But again, just to be clear, he says that those who don't heed this instruction shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he switches to the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now with this in the back of your mind, come back to verse 3 of chapter 5, the first beatitude in the first set of three, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's alluding to Paul's presentation of the Torah in Galatians. 
He's summarizing the Torah. He's packaging it for a broad audience. There's another way we could translate this, and this is poor by the Spirit, meaning those who are made poor by the Spirit, because the Spirit is something that judges through the Word. It's not just, am I poor in spirit? It's, has the Spirit made you poor? Have you understood that you are poor because of this teaching? The Spirit proves to you that you're lacking because that's how the Word comes to you. The Spirit is what animates us and motivates us and produces our deeds. Do we produce the deeds of a poor person, similar to children who are completely dependent? The poor person is completely dependent on the ones around them, but it's the spirit that breaks down the human ego who thinks that he can do whatever he wants. He's a self-made man or woman. No, the spirit shows that you're poor and you're dependent. Of them is the kingdom of heaven, which is a way that Avton can be translated, meaning the kingdom of heaven is made up of the sorts of people who have been made poor by the spirit. The teaching has proved to them, the spirit has animated them so that they understand themselves to be poor and act as poor people dependent on God. That's exactly how Mark will later handle the little children. We talked about that in a previous episode. Of such is the kingdom. The poor, in this sense, are analogous to the little children. They are powerless. This is the function of the Torah. It's to make you powerless, to show you that you're incapable of following all these regulations. You were put on display in Deuteronomy for everyone to see as an example. And Paul hits this hard in Romans as an example of sin. And you were given these lengthy laws to make it absolutely certain beyond the shadow of a doubt that one way or another, you were made an example of sin. That's what poverty and weakness and being childlike is all about, that you are in such a position that you don't resist that judgment against you. And makarios, blessed, can also be translated as happy or glad, that sort of thing. You're not happy because of the Spirit. You're not made happy by the Spirit. You're happy because the Spirit has made you poor, which is already counterintuitive. I mean, let's take, I don't know, the United States for an example. Who says that the happiest people in this country are the ones who have been made poor? Neither the right nor the left is going to agree with that statement. But this is precisely what Jesus is saying. Not only is this, this is something that the Spirit is supposed to do. Happy are those, blessed are those who are made poor by the Spirit. And that's the beginning point of not just this teaching he's giving here, but his entire teaching is that you must begin, if you want to be of them who are members of the kingdom, with the poverty that the Spirit brings. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Again, this follows the storyline of Paul's letter, because once he introduces the fruit of the Spirit... He then immediately launches into the crucifixion and into bearing one another's burdens and into the importance of not losing hope but persevering. So someone who's under the pressure of the commandment is a person who in worldly terms is not only poor but is in a sense mourning even though they're rejoicing and not losing hope. As this beautiful monastic saying from our tradition goes, a saying I repeat often, keep your mind in hell, but do not lose hope. That is pure Pauline wisdom. It's pure scriptural wisdom. We just mentioned how the spirit is going to force you to act and live as a poor person. But here it says they're going to be comforted. So what's the spirit doing? Sometimes it's making you feel bad. Sometimes it's making you feel good. That's kind of an oversimplification. What's going on here? Well, those who mourn are the ones who are worried about the things that are passing away, those things that are dying. Those are the people who mourn. And so the one who comforts you, and interestingly, it's Paracletison de, John uses the Paracleti to talk about the spirit that's going to be sent. Now, I'm, of course, bringing from John into Matthew. I understand that we have to follow the storyline, but we can already understand how John is understanding Paracliti because here we have the thing that's going to be comforting them. It's the spirit that comforts you. Why? Because as you mourn the things that pass away, the spirit reminds you 
that the things that pass away don't matter. It's only the things that are heavenly, like the heavenly Jerusalem and the heavenly kingdom. Before John, you have it in Galatians, Richard, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So that's the comfort that comes from the fruit of the Spirit. It's the hope against hope that despite what you see, despite the apparent poverty and the apparent sadness, there is hope in the promise of the seed which you are called to sow. The human being wants to put faith in the things that make him feel powerful. Money, family, their house, their job. This is what they put their faith in. So what does the spirit do? The first thing, it has to make you realize that you're poor. All the money, all the people around you, the house, the job, everything, you are completely dependent on those things. Those are not yours. The second thing is once you're sad about losing all those things, it's saying, what are you sad about? Those things didn't matter. The spirit goes both directions. First, it makes you feel poor because it makes you realize that all these things that I was basing my strength and my honor and my glory on are passing away. And then once they pass away, reminds you, don't feel bad. Those things were always going to pass away. Depend on God completely. Depend completely. And this goes back to Hosea, where Yahweh was trying to teach the land to depend not on the Baal that she supposed she could control, but on Yahweh, who gives completely, who needs nothing from her in return. Now, in verse 5, you have, in a way, the cornerstone that seals the connection. Galatians, and I want to stress, as always, the connection has to come through terminology, not just themes or topics. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. The word gentle here, prais, is rendered praftis in Galatians because Paul is talking about an action. He's not naming someone as gentle. He's saying be gentle, gentleness. But it appears twice. First, at the beginning, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And then Later in chapter 6, he comes around again and talks about the responsibility of those who are spiritual, the pneumatiki, those who are walking according to the commandments of God's law. Those ones must restore those who have fallen away with a spirit of prathis, gentleness. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He is restoring the gathered crowds with the spirit of gentleness. It's a signature word. So now we have Paul's summation of the Torah from Galatians encapsulated in this first triptych of the Beatitudes as the summation Matthew puts on the lips of the Matthean Jesus. You know, the King James has the classic, blessed are the meek. I prefer meek as a translation. And the difference between gentle and meek, gentle is someone who's magnanimous who is deciding, in spite of their strength, to act with gentleness. But meek is someone who, in spite of themselves, can't raise their voice high enough. After the Spirit has crushed you and made you realize you're completely dependent, and after it tries to convince you that all those things you're depending on are not worth anything, meekness seems to be the correct word, the antithesis of glory. Because a gentle person can still be glory-filled. They can still be glorious. But a meek person cannot be glorious. They're the ones who are going to inherit the earth because they're the ones who feel uncomfortable opening up their mouth because they're not worthy to speak. And that's the image that I think works here, especially when it says they're the ones who will inherit the earth because it's those who are poor by the Spirit that will make up the kingdom of heaven. In a way, it's good that for example, the text of the New American Standard Bible uses the word gentle here and the word gentleness in Galatians, not because I agree or disagree with it being rendered as gentle and gentleness. I agree with the consistency. That's helpful. The consistency in the way they translated this Greek term makes it possible for someone to see the connection in English. Having said that, the word praftis in Galatians could easily be rendered not only as meek, but as humble, practicing humility, practicing meekness, being gentle. All these ideas are interconnected. 
So it's not in a way excluding gentle, but the word gentle falls short. And I think your point about meekness is correct because in the end, Jesus is not speaking. And that's what Paul is getting at in Galatians. Those of you who are spiritual of the spirit, the epnevmatiki, your responsibility is to restore the one who's fallen away in the spirit of meekness where you don't speak because you're meek and small and poor, but the Torah speaks. That's why you should never, ever fall in the trap of hearing someone announce something with authority and then saying, as people are wont to say in the United States, who are you to talk that way and how come you're so arrogant and, 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 and. No, no, don't be fooled. Listen to the content. And if the content is correct, and if we're talking about scripture, if the content is scripture, then you should kiss that person's hand for speaking with authority because they're demonstrating that it's not their authority. Set aside your own glory and listen and be taught. Jesus teaches you are made poor by the spirit. You are comforted by that same spirit to let go those things in which you put your trust, which are the basis of your glory, and you become meek. And it's only then as meek made poor by the spirit, yet comforted that those things that you depended on are meaningless, that you can finally become potentially members of the kingdom of heaven and inheritors of the earth. And this is exactly the point about Galatians, Richard, the way that Paul gives the Gentile and now the Jew also. Remember, it's an eclectic gathering around Jesus seated in glory on the mountain. He gives them a shortcut because if you're still stubborn, and you still believe you're righteous, and you still believe your own glory, as you said just a minute ago, then let's go back to the beginning and read you pages and pages and pages and pages of instructions that were given to drill you into the ground until you accept that you are dust. Or you could hear what I'm saying, that you are poor. You should mourn in this life. You should be gentle and meek and humble so that you can inherit the kingdom. I'm giving you, Jesus is saying here in Matthew, a shortcut. Take it. The cross is a shortcut. At the end of the day, if you are willing to submit and to give your life for the cause of the gospel, which is the love of neighbor, the problem is solved. That's what is being offered as a gift here in Matthew, which is God's gift. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.